Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast, where it's all about turning your job search into a slam dunk. Your host is Angela Copeland. Welcome to the Copeland Coaching Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Copeland. On the phone with me today, I have Albert Chen in Los Angeles, California. Albert is the founder and community manager of Albert's List. Albert's List is a Facebook jobs community with over 20,000 members. Albert's List helps both new graduates and seasoned professionals find meaningful work and connect to other professionals. Albert, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's so nice to meet you. We were just chatting a little bit uh, before we got started. I mentioned to you I recently joined Albert's List to check it out. It's a great community, and I'm curious, how. when did you originally found it? I originally founded Albert's List on in March of 2013, uh, and as I was telling you uh, in this story, in the conversation we were just having before now, it was on a very disengaged day at work where, you know, I was uh, I had been sharing a lot of job postings and job listings in between getting work done, of course, and I was thinking, you know, maybe I should start a group uh, or a page, and I eventually started of the group and it's actually been quite a fantastic decision oh that's great so is the group uh, open to jobs all different kinds of job seekers yeah it is and uh, so the main idea actually really is that the group we have a lot of technology jobs uh, for at least the main Albert's list group that many people are in and that's uh, generally for those who are in the San Francisco Bay Area but we also post jobs from pretty much all sorts of different walks of life and verticals because, you know, we just want to help people get to work and find those opportunities. And so if you come into Albert's List on any given day, you may even find, and I saw this yesterday, a carpentry job. I don't know anyone who needs to, who works in carpentry, but it's nice to know that if that opportunity was something that somebody wanted, it would be available through my group. Oh, that's great. So do the community members share the job postings with one another? They do, yeah. And so we we do encourage a free-flowing conversation around careers on a daily basis. And so uh, that includes encouraging people to introduce themselves, uh, encouraging people to ask for advice and ask for help. And, you know, it's really created a great uh, community vibe over the last couple of years. Members are extremely supportive, especially on posts where people are asking for advice. Uh, people are uh, fe- people feel like they have the ability to be vulnerable. And, you know, I think the favorite type of post that I have is when somebody jumps in and says, hey, I found a job. Uh-huh. And, you know, we encourage everyone to celebrate. And, uh, you know, that also adds to the factor that it gives people who have been hunting for a while the hope to know that the group works the advice works and that the support works too. Yeah, that's great. Well, you mentioned that you were in a situation in 2013 where you weren't quite sure why you were going to work every day, but now you have something, it sounds like, well, what's what's changed for you professionally over the time that you've been working on Albert's List? Well, you know, so I think that uh, what I literally discovered in the midst of creating this group and really as my career transition. Uh, you know, so I I was I, I switched jobs I think about a month after I started this group and I lasted that job for about six months before getting laid off and then I went to a contract job for that, which I lasted another four months and then that contract ended and it was February of twenty fourteen and I really had no idea uh what I was doing. I know I, I was working in social media at the time and a part of me really wanted to get out. And I was interviewing for two months. It wasn't really getting anywhere. I got really lucky on one of my job leads and eventually took that job and discovered that, you know, hey, maybe this product marketing thing is my thing. Mm -hmm. And so I I took that role. And, you know, overall, my uh, my mindset kind of transitioned from a job where I think it was me first to company first. Mm -hmm. And... This, this notion, I think, really started out early in my career where I approached my job like it was a hobby of mine. I showed up because 
it was something I wanted to do and it was something that was going to serve me and not necessarily the people who worked around me or my company or the stakeholders. And I think what changed was going from that me first mindset to the we first, where, you know, we're, we're obviously, we obviously know our axioms of business, right? Businesses go in business to stay in business and mm-hmm. businesses go into business to make a profit. And I know it's really, it's a really like dry way of looking at it, but you know, that's, that's how, that's how we all get our paychecks. I thank sales every time I see them. And and so it turned into this, let's find ways to work together to affect change and hopefully make some money while doing it. And, and I think that's something that I noticed in both running Albert's List and being able to drive results and be results-driven and be impact-driven mm-hmm. as opposed to being self-driven. And so I think that's the difference between the second half of my career so far, and I even call it a half, maybe it's a third or a quarter, and the first half, third or quarter of my career. That's really interesting, you know, because a lot of times when we go into job interviews, we're asked questions, and sometimes the way that we answer, whether our answers are sort of self-serving or whether our answers are more about, you know, what we bring to the table for the company and how we can help the company, like, I think it can actually make a big difference in, you mm-hmm. know, in terms of the outcome of the interview. So it's really interesting that you identify that. That's cool. Um, well, so another thing that can actually really help us when we're interviewing is really working on our personal brand. And I saw mm-hmm. a presentation that you gave. I found it online about um, turbo turbocharging our job search in 2017. And the mm-hmm. number one tip that you came out with was evolving the personal brand. So the first question I have for you is, from your perspective, what do you think makes up the personal brand? Like, what are the parts and the pieces? Yeah, so I think the I think that personal branding is really important because we live in such a noisy world and we really have to find ways to stand out. It's kind of funny how in in this modern world, we're kind of like our own businesses uh, as mm-hmm. individuals, right? And entrepreneurship has gotten into has, has turned into a whole entirely different mantra and mindset over the last couple of years. And I think that it applies to how we look for work because, as you know, Pierce has told me, it's not who you know and it's not what you know anymore. It's who knows you. Mm-hmm. And so your ability to stand out in that crowded market is very indicative of your of your ability to create that personal brand. And I consider the personal brand to be a mix of several things. Uh, the first thing would be like what you believe in personally and the vision that you see for the world. And so, you know, a lot of us, I think, go through life just kind of surviving and not necessarily thriving. And I think our message and our vision for the world is really key because it's what helps us wake up in the morning and get through the day, mm-hmm. knowing at your toughest time when you're working that there's a greater piece of what you're trying to do. And I think that's and then, and that's the first piece. The second piece is what you're committed to and what your commitments are. So how you execute upon what you believe and what you... Uh, what your what your vision for the world is, whether that's through a job, whether that's through a nonprofit that you volunteer for, or whether that's through a side project that you're working on. And then I think your personal brand is also a manifestation of who you surround yourself with and where you go to go and surround yourself with. So as marketers, it's always important to know what platforms you're hanging out on and where your customer or where your buyer or where your community is. And so, you know, you could be somebody who hangs out on Snapchat or does a lot of tweeting or grows large Facebook communities like me mm-hmm. and really seeks to know, I think, in number, in, in number like three here, uh, number four rather, uh, where, what kind of impact you seek to deliver, whether that's helping people find jobs, lowering the cost of something, uh, increasing awareness for some particular thing, whether if you're working in a nonprofit, or just, you know, advancing the cause of technology, for example, if you live in Silicon Valley. 
And so you add the four of these together, and I think that's kind of what creates purpose. And, and I want to, I think, make it clear here that I think purpose is a very, very loaded term and a very a widely used and to some degree abused term. Mm. I know some are millennial. I'm 29 <laughs> years old, born in the mid-80s, and I know we get a lot of flack for uh, not being so business savvy in the workplace. And that uh, we have, I have a lot of contemporaries and peers who write books and blogs and talk about this notion of purpose and passion, like it's something that's absolutely required and uh, mandatory, because if, you know, you don't wake up every day not knowing what you want to do, then I don't know why I wake up at all for some <laughs> Sure. Right, and so, and, and, and it's the whole mantra that, you know, I even felt for this when I graduated, and my mother gave me the weirdest looks, because I was like, she was like saying, so you want to love what you do and do what you love? Is that what I'm hearing from you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> And, and, and as, as I've as I've gone through as I've gone through my career, you know, I realized a couple of things with this other aspect of the personal brand on purpose is that you're not going to be doing something you love every single day, but what you do in general is something you probably should tolerate. And, and the other aspect is that I'm, you know, in in running Albert's List over the years, uh, I've I've met a lot of different types of job seekers, and I've kind of distilled them into three and there probably are more okay. you know there are the people who are looking to survive there are the people who are looking to uh, lead and there are the people who are looking to create that to create an overall larger like visionary type of profile mm -hmm. and so I'll go backwards on this so the visionary type of profile person comes into work on the first day knows exactly why they're there they're there to create they're there to uh, lead the company forward and they're there to do really, really great things. And it's just, it's even higher than purpose. And the second part, the second person there knows their purpose and they're not quite ready to lead, but they know exactly why they're there. Mm -hmm. They're passionate about it and they're okay being that individual contributor. And the final person is the person who's just there to survive. They're there to pay the bills because we all have bills to pay. Mm -hmm. And they exist at work because they have they have that need for that money. And I see all three kinds, kinds of people on my list every single day. Mm -hmm. And so tying this back to your personal brand, I think, you know, it's important to have that overall high-level arching piece of why. But I think that high-level piece of your personal brand also comes with a lot of caveats, too. So do you think that people in those three categories, the ones who are trying to survive, you know, the ones who know their purpose and those who are really trying to do something big with their leadership, do you think that those people are always kind of stuck in that lane or do they, does it vary? Can one person be more than one type at different times? Absolutely. I think that, I think that all of us start in one of these three categories and there is definite mobility to move from one category to another. So you can start as somebody who's looking to survive and then eventually become that visionary or that purpose-driven person. Or you can start as that visionary from day one, you know, as like a high school graduate and know exactly what you want and pursue it. And then eventually know that you have to survive because you got to figure out how to pay the bills or just be that entire visionary your entire life. And I think we see this in examples throughout life where, you know, you see these people who are like young prodigies or they come out of nowhere and they're like 17, 18, 19 and speaking on stages mm -hmm. in front of thousands of people and you look at them and you're like, wow, these people know exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, early on, I think when we're really young, it's easy to become jealous of people who are both purposeful and visionary because it's like, oh my gosh, I want that, but I can't get that today because it requires work. And I think all of these things come out over time as you experience life and you meet more people and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so if we're listening today and we are interested to sort of improve our own personal brand or evolve these components mm -hmm. that you described, I mean, where would you suggest that we really begin? I would say I would say you begin with your about me statement. So as you know, on LinkedIn, we all have our summary statement. And I think that summary statement presents a great opportunity to showcase ourselves and tell the world who we are in, you know, two succinct paragraphs. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, And so that's where you talk about, hey, my name is, you know, Albert, and I'm a marketing manager at Proficient. I believe that cloud and enterprise technologies have the opportunity to transition the world into a new way of thinking. And, you know, you just kind of go on from there and talk about what it is that you are, what it is that you're looking for, and how people can best help you. I think the other thing I've learned with running Albert's List is that people have an innate interest in helping people who would like to help themselves. Hmm. And that, you know, when people come to, uh, you can you can definitely lead a horse to water, and if that horse is willing to drink that water, then you definitely can't stop that horse. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. Well, so you mentioned the summary, like on LinkedIn, as, as an mm-hmm. example. And a question that I often hear is, well, I've already got that information in the rest of my LinkedIn or in a mm-hmm. resume. I've already that's already in my resume. Right. Why would I want to summarize it at the top in a paragraph? I mean, it's already there. So yeah, I'm, sh- I'm sure you've heard that. People have <laughs> short attention spans, and they need to they need to they need to be able to see something that can tell them in a quick, short bit who you are, what mm-hmm. you are, and what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, as the digital sort of world and the internet has become more and more important into our lives. I think this personal brand also transfers into the digital space. And it does. would you say that the main place that you look to brand yourself online is LinkedIn or would you also look at other places too? Uh, I would look at other places as well. I think LinkedIn is definitely a area of great opportunity. Mm-hmm. I think that in addition to LinkedIn, uh, having your own website is also a great place to start, uh, and also just getting yourself out into the areas where you know you'll meet other people. So, for example, if you're in uh, the marketing space, it behooves you to at least be tweeting every now and again, mm-hmm. or experimenting with new social media platforms and having an opinion on these social media platforms that uh, other people can learn from. And in addition to being on LinkedIn, I think there's also an importance for attending the right types of networking events and putting yourself in front of the appropriate communities where people can get to know you too and also uh, really be present so that you can open yourself to opportunities and uh, meeting new people Mm -hmm. and just getting to know whatever industry you are in a lot better. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned having your own website can be really special. And I totally agree with you. Um, Building a website can sometimes be challenging, especially if maybe we don't come from the technology space. Mm -hmm. When you talk to someone that's interested to build their own website, but maybe they haven't before, what suggestions do you give them on how to get started? Yeah. So WordPress is one of the more durable and dynamic uh, website platforms that have emerged mm-hmm. over the last, I would say, 20 years. And you can purchase uh, your own WordPress website using uh, your own domain, or you can use uh, their pre-baked platform. I think WordPress.org is that platform mm-hmm. to build your site. And then, you know, if you don't really want to code or do any of those things, you can also use uh, third-party sites, too, where you kind of just, uh, build what's uh, the kind of like what you see is what you get kind of sites. Uh, and one of the sites that I really like that's really simple and elegant is a site called uh, Strikingly. Uh, and Strikingly is um, you basically drag and drop different pieces of web content that you want into their editor and it publishes right there for you and you can see it all. Oh, that's interesting. So for someone who's looking for a job and say they've gone to Strikingly and they're trying to build their own website, Mm -hmm. maybe they even have their own domain name that's something like, you know, um, albertchen.com. What kind of information do you think that they should be sharing on that personal site, you know, that would be helpful to a job Mm -hmm. search? I think it'd be a link to a portfolio. Mm -hmm. It would be a link to any other uh, professional social media profiles that they might have online. Uh, I think in addition, if there's a possibility to include a link to a blog or even using LinkedIn Pulse, uh, they should link that way too. Mm-hmm. And then contact information. Mm-hmm. And of course, that about me statement. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Totally. I completely agree. The other thing I really love to see on those personal websites is you can actually uh, just kind of copy and paste the recommendations mm-hmm. that you get from LinkedIn, like the endor- yes. endorsements. Yes, absolutely. It's kind of cool that, you know, you can have those quotes from the people who've left you uh, recommendations on LinkedIn. It's, it's really a neat, neat tool. So um, anyway, that's a, that's a really good idea. Well, so you mm-hmm. also mentioned networking and that yes. networking is a really critical piece of the job search. Um, can you give us a little bit of an idea from your perspective, like what is networking and what is not networking? <laughs> Help us to understand yeah, the difference. Yeah, so I mean, I think that many in your audience and many who I speak to have this very negative connotation of networking where you're just kind of approaching people and mm-hmm. selling, selling, selling with the hopes of closing some jobs, right? And early on, I think in my career and talking to a lot of people, you know, I've been I've been lobbed the question, should I bring my resume to a networking event? And so, you know, networking is building relationships. It's building relationships. It's putting yourself out there in a professional, cordial, friendly setting. And it's adding value into the lives of others. And it's, it's kind of one of those really subtle kind of things where if you add value to others, then you can have value given back to you. Mm -hmm. Um, Networking to me is actually a representative of one of my favorite quotes by famed uh, sales trainer and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar, who said that you can have anything that you want, you just have to give other people what they want first. And yeah, and so I think that because, because I think when you come from this point of want and need, as some of my friends have said, you never get what you want and you never get what you need. But if you (laughs) give other people what they want, they'll most definitely ask you what it is that they can help you with as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. So that's, I think, the best way to network is to do what you can to give. And and even, even if you're like this new graduate who's like, oh, I have nothing to give. Um, In truth, you have probably more to give than a lot of people because you come into industry with fresh new ideas, this hunger and this energy to transform and change uh, that maybe the industry hasn't even seen yet. I think that's a really good point. I do think there are a lot of young people or even people who are switching to a new industry that are hesitant to network because they feel like they don't bring anything to the table. So that that really is a good point that you even when you are young you have something new and different to bring Mm -hmm. yeah i think so absolutely you know the other kind of objection i often hear about networking is people will Mm -hmm. say to me well angela i'm not you know i don't want to network because they don't have a job available like Mm -hmm. they don't have a job for me why would i network right now and the thing is that people aren't you're not networking specifically to get a job the very first time you're networking to get to know someone and then if you become someone they trust they'll think of you when they are looking to hire like so it's networking in my opinion is an activity that centers more around awareness than actual sales Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like marketing where uh you're when you're when you're doing sales that's like the interview and the phone interview and networking itself is just like the business development of careers. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, you're there You're there to get to know people, put them on your radar. And so as every single one of my friends and colleagues and professional mentors say, you know, you should network before you need a job. Because, exactly. Because, you know, when you need that job, that's when that network kicks into high gear. And so, you know, I saw this last year when I was laid off from my previous job where... You know, you do your networking and uh, you build your group. And I think I was late. I was laid off about a year ago, two weeks ago. And I think Albert's list was at ten, eleven thousand people at that point. And uh, I, I posted in my group and I posted on my own personal page. And the response was just astounding. And you know, I didn't end up getting a job from my network, but mm-hmm. the willingness of my network to go out of their way to help me and you know, I think one touching statement I had someone tell me was, you know, you you helped me when I was at my lowest point, and so I'm here to help you. Let me know what you need. Oh, that's so and nice. So, 
Yeah, it was really, really touching because, you know, I had, I, I, I simply had the group for him and I had tagged him in a couple of jobs and, you know, he, he ended up getting a job, I think, through another means, but the support and the advice that he had received from my group was, I think, so overwhelmingly positive that he was willing to go out of his way to do whatever he could for me. And so I think that's networking and not really even networking at that point. It's just relationship building and mm-hmm. being a kind person and good humans helping other good humans. Oh, that's a great story because it is really yeah. hard when people get laid off. It feels, even if it's not, if it has nothing to do with you or your performance, yeah. like there's something going yeah. on in the company, it still feels bad, you know. So to have people s- stand up and help is really awesome. Yep. Yeah. Well, so when it comes to networking, another thing that often comes up, and I get this question a lot, is so as adults, we sometimes relocate to a new city in order to take like take a new job. And in the past, when we were in college or in graduate school or even in high school, you know, friends were almost provided to us on a plate. Like you had classmates and or you, you know, played basketball or, or whatever it was. But there were people sort of peers around that were automatically friends. But mm-hmm. when we moved to a new city, say like we moved to California, it can be so much harder to meet new people as adults when we're 30 or 40 or 50 Mm -hmm. years old. So I'm curious, what suggestions or advice do you have when it comes to sort of networking in a new place where we really don't know anyone? Yeah, so are you talking about from like moving to a new city or moving into a new industry? Yeah, I'm moving to a new city. Like, say I moved from Memphis to, you know, the Los Angeles area as an adult. How do I Mm -hmm. really get plugged in there? Yeah, so I think that it's actually easier than ever to meet people. Um, Meetup.com is always one of my go-to spots whenever I'm looking for something, something or somebody that shares a common interest or a common path. Uh, I think that uh, if you're moving to a new city, uh, transplant groups are always really good for finding that kind of community. I know that when I first moved to Orange County, I joined a couple of transplant groups myself and where I was able to meet a lot of really cool people who I think were in a similar in a similar boat. They're in this new city. They have no idea who to meet, who to talk to, and we're all here to just kind of get to know each other and build that support network. Mm-hmm. Um I think it kind of goes similar within the realm of a career. And so I think in my presentations, I talk about how when you are in a situation where you're either going into a new career or figuring out what your career path is, there's a certain, I think, specific type of like networking event that you should go to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're, if you're just a new graduate and you're in a new town or you're, you're, you're in your old town, I think that, It really just starts with putting yourself out there, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially if you don't know what kind of networking event or what kind of networking you should do. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a lot of different networking events pretty much every single day. I think one really good general one is called Networking After Work, and they do this in all sorts of cities around the country. Mm -hmm. And you just show up, you put on your name tag with a color that designates your industry, and then you just go talk to people. And then obviously, if you have an idea of what you want to do, it's important to join different types of professional associations or different types of groups that are centered around the industry that you're in. So for example, tonight, I'm headed to a technology networking event out here in Orange County. Mm -hmm. And while it's probably a lot more uh, technical than my marketing background suggests, being around those people is important because it allows me to continue getting a a viewpoint of what my industry is going through and what the technical people think are the trends and things driving uh, what people are doing. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I'm always very impressed with people who work in technology and their sort of (laughs) networking skills because, uh, you know, technology is changing so fast that you Mm -hmm. really just can't stay home and just go to work every day and never sort of look outside your box you you really no, it's a very volatile yeah. industry and so you really do have to get out of your box because you mm-hmm. never know when the next transition uh, uh transitions come and you know you may be a victim of layoffs 
Yeah, and things like, so for example, like with the industry that you work in, you know, Mm -hmm. you're rarely probably ever going to take a class in how to use Instagram or how to, you know, any kind of, (laughs) right, you have to teach yourself and you have to talk to other people and see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's very self-taught and self-driven and these networking events are an opportunity to do that, um, which I, you know, I think is so important. Um, so it's interesting that you that you bring that up. Um, I think the other thing when you move to a new city that's important to keep in mind is to give yourself a break when it comes to how quickly things should happen. Um, yeah, I think that even with like a job search, right, where mm-hmm. everybody is, I mean, you know, we live in the insta, insta economy. So, uh, and, and, you know, I think we all suffer from this, debilitating thing where we just aren't present in our lives at all Mm -hmm. and we want that job yesterday we wanted that significant other two hours ago Mm -hmm. and we want everything delivered to us via uber (laughs) all of these things right and and the thing with the career with a career is that all that stuff takes time Mm -hmm. and that you have to really be mindful and also be present with yourself to know that these things aren't going to happen immediately, mm-hmm. um, even though everything else seems to be going at the crazy breakneck speed that it goes at. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, yeah, you have to be patient. You have to really, um, you have to really respect the process. Mm-hmm. And I think we're all guilty of hoping that that process is a heck of a lot faster when it's not. <laughs> I know, right? It may be because we just. We see our friends get jobs, we, but we only kind of see it at the very end when things come together. And oh, yeah. We didn't, oh, yeah. It's sort of like when there's a celebrity and they're suddenly famous on, you know, a big movie. Mm-hmm. And it seems like they it happened overnight. But in reality, they were working on that for years. <laughs> yeah, overnight. An overnight success, as they say, I think is like a five-year five year journey. Right. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we're all caught up in the social media world, I think. Mm -hmm. I I was equally guilty of this, too, when I first graduated, noticing how many friends landed in really great jobs and were doing what they were doing. And meanwhile, you know, I'm struggling here in these contract gigs, trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And, you know, it was was very very eye-opening to just see how unpresent I was and... You know, at the end of the day, you just realize that, hey, journey is a journey, and uh, it's important not to have that uh, fear of missing out, because, you know, if you work for it, you'll get it, too, mm-hmm. and just, you know, keep keep to the grind and keep working at it, and you can have your version of what your friends are having, mm-hmm. especially since their story is going to be very significantly different than yours. Yeah, I mean, you know, so speaking of journey, the the journey that you've had with Albert's List that you've kind of talked about, I'm curious, now that you've kind of had that experience, what is your sort of personal opinion of job boards? Do you think that they work? And, you know, do you recommend that we check out job boards if we're looking for a job? Absolutely. I think it's it's my opinion that if you're looking for a job, you need to throw the kitchen sink at whatever it is that you're looking at, mm-hmm. uh, or rather the whole kitchen sink at the process, because <laughs> that sets you up for the best outcomes and the best possibilities. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, in some ways, not enough people are willing to do the things that uh, they're willing to that are that are needed to be done in order to get the job that they want. Right? You hear a lot of excuses. You hear a lot of. Um, I'm not really willing to do that because of, you know, putting in this kind of work Mm -hmm. outside of obviously like, yeah, you know, I'm bound by location or I have family or things like that. But, you know, if you're, if you're single and you're young and you have no obligations, geographic location, where you start, the money that you start by making should never be a restriction on your ability to get the career that you want. Um, I, I recall my last job search, actually, where uh, in a 36-hour span, I started out the morning in Orange County. I drove down to San Diego for an interview. I drove back from San Diego to Orange County. And then that afternoon, I went up to L.A. for a networking event. I left that networking event around 9 p.m. 
to drive up to the Bay Area, where I ended up uh, going to my parents' house and sleeping in my childhood bed, getting in there about 2 a.m. Uh, my mother burst into my room at 5 a.m., not knowing that I was there, and was completely surprised. And then about uh, about 8 a.m., I had a phone interview, followed by an in-person interview in San Francisco at uh, 11, followed by another in-person interview at a startup at 2, followed by another phone interview at 5. Mm-hmm. And I pretty much, and then I, and then I went back to my parents' house, and you know, I woke up the next morning and did it all over again. And so, yeah, I, I locked about I don't know seven hundred miles in a day. Mm-hmm. But it, the, the whole point of that is that you know, if you're given the opportunity to go far and go wide and explore a variety of job opportunities, uh, the the impetus is that you should definitely go and do it, um, and that nothing. Nothing should stop you at all. Mm-hmm. I completely agree, and that's a great example. I think very often I meet people who say, "Well, that sounds really hard," uh, mm-hmm. but but sometimes it is hard, but it pays off in the end. Like that's how you yeah. find the job that you want that will you know allow you to do what you want to do. <laughs> it's not supposed to be easy because I think if we were all able to land jobs so easily, we probably wouldn't value employment as much as we do. Right. Right. And I mean, maybe it could be easy to land jobs, but to land the job that you want that Mm -hmm. is fulfilling to you or that pays the amount that you're looking for, that's where it gets harder and that's where it's worth putting in that extra work. Yes, very true. Very true. Well, so if we've been listening today and we're interested to sign up for Albert's List and learn more about you, where should we go? Yeah, so you can go to the Facebook page to get started since we're still working on the website. Uh, the Facebook page is, uh, the short link is bit.ly bit.ly uh, slash find your next job. And you can also actually join our a variety of other groups too from this, uh, from this main listing as well. So we also have groups in Seattle, Southern California, uh, Vegas, Austin, Chicago, New York City, and some offshoot groups that have been inspired for other people uh, that also exist in South Florida and Barcelona. Oh, that's great. Well, I will put links uh, to your your you know, Albert's List on uh, the website and also on the podcast show notes. And I hope great. that lots of people will check it out. But Albert, thank you so much for joining me. This has been great. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I really appreciated the conversation. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and thanks to those of you who sent me questions. You can send your questions to Angela at copelandcoaching.com. You can also send me questions via Twitter. I'm at Copeland Coach, and on Facebook, I'm Copeland Coaching. And don't forget to help me out. Subscribe on iTunes and leave me a review. Thank you for listening to the Copeland Coaching Podcast today with your host, Angela Copeland. Tune in next time to get more great tips on turning your job search into a slam dunk.